Hello and welcome to the Startup Operator Podcast. I'm Roshan Karipa. Depending on your source, there could be over 5,000 or 8,000 B-Schools in the country. And most of them suffer from the hangover of the outsourcing era when MBAs first came into vogue. Stoa School is striving to change all of that. I spoke to Raj, who is the co-founder and chief vibe officer of Stoa, on how they're building this B-School targeted at helping startups get the talent they need and deserve. This is not uh, Raj's first foray in the edtech space, and he's run a bunch of experiments before. So it's not surprising that he's really deliberate about his execution, including the kind of vibe they want to cultivate. And uh, this was an interesting chat, plenty of lessons in here that could be useful to you. So let's get started with this episode of the Startup Operator Podcast with Raj of Stoa School. Hey, Raj, welcome to the Startup Operator Podcast. Thank you so much for making the time. Hey, Roshan. Nice, nice to be here, man. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Really looking forward to this conversation. So Raj, I mean, to begin things, right? I thought we can start with your experience. You've had a fairly diverse journey so far. And the thing that I see is that you've had, um, you know, multiple uh, ideas and projects, right? I mean, you've had Bricks and Seeker Space and Nova Samita and Yuva Fund and all of these different ideas and projects, right? So I wonder, you know, if you could ta- talk about, you know, your lessons from turning these ideas into projects and then into companies. Mm-hmm. Got it. So I think to give you a quick background, I graduated from college with a physics degree in, in 2016 with almost no intention of, you know, being an entrepreneur, having sort of, you know, spent my time at bits. Of course, I saw a lot of fanfare around entrepreneurship from the outside. I saw a lot of people uh, getting into it, but being, you know, the physics kind, liking all those uh, communist meme pages back in the day on, on Facebook, I was uh, pretty much had, you know, a not so positive view on anything to do with money, right? And that included business. So that is where, you know, the whole journey began. One thing that I knew I really uh, want to do was, you know, be in education, right? So when my PhD scene did not work out as I intended it to, I decided to spend some time teaching students, right? I got together with a friend of mine who I had started an NGO with way back uh, before even I got into college and joined his like small education venture or classes that used to run teaching kids math and science and so on so that's where you know i got my like first salary so to say Mm -hmm. first whatever earnings as uh, an entrepreneur and there was always something inside of me which was like you know what you should be doing more you should be bringing about more impact than just teaching some 10 kids around you right so (laughs) that that itch sort of led me to you know solving my own problems because that is all i all i knew that, hey, this, uh, I want to use this, this needs to exist. So why don't I try and build this? And the first idea that came about was that of, you know, Vriksh, which was, why don't I build AI bot? It was 2016, so AI was pretty much the, the in thing, 2016, 2017, right? So why don't I build a search engine, which takes into account where I am in my learning journey, where I want to go to and suggest me relevant learning resources, mm. right? Uh, because of course, Google, if you just Google for a term, you are lost, right? Um, right. All the resources it throws at you. So I spent about, I think, six to eight months trying to, you know, solve this problem. I had zero knowledge of, of tech. I had zero knowledge of product. Absolutely no understanding of markets, right? I thought that, hey, I have I have this problem. So everyone must have the problem. So let's build this, right? So Classic. Classic, right? Went into the very academic route because that's all I knew. So let me make a list of all subjects that <laughs> people Google for. Then let me try and build a taxonomy of, you know, what disciplines come under what uh, this, let me scrape some data rather than actually conducting user interviews and you know, mm. thinking in terms of an MVP, right? So my first sort of uh, adventure like crashed into the ground because of that, because I, I did not do any user interviews. I did not think about monetization. I was like, chalo, ads chalang you know? Mm. Someone will pay ads because this is whatever Google, right? It, it works that way ads mm. uh, <laughs> and the business model is out of place. So l- learned a bunch of things. This is when I got introduced to Y Combinator and, you know, the whole startup school scene going through those videos. So after that, we decided to do something more, you know, down to earth. We set up a co-learning space in Goa. Uh, which was like, our idea was that, hey, why don't we set up this research thingy wherein we call people who, you know, cool people who are doing research, uh, fund them and get them to also teach on the site, teach kids or teach whoever. 
right that actually was a fun experiment of setting up a physical space right something that you can see in front of your own eyes rather than a digital mm. product so that that was fun but then again doing that in goa i realized was a bad idea because there's almost no market for anything beyond tuitions right mm. in goa this was 20 late 2017 mm. uh, early 2018 still like people are Baiju's was still, you know, blazing through uh, at that point of time. An academy was not not really known in many parts of the country. So I learned that, you know, if you if you if you have the right idea, but if, if it's in the wrong time at the wrong place, it's as good as useless, right? Mm, mm. This may have worked in Bangalore, might have worked in the valley, but no takers in India or Goa, right? Tier to India for such an idea. Moved on, got onto Twitter. In fact, a friend of mine introduced me to Twitter saying that, Hey, you're not in Bangalore, you're based in Goa. So you need to learn stuff. Why don't you just go on Twitter instead? 2018 India startup Twitter was not a, not as big a deal as it is now. I think uh, almost like one fourth, the number of people on there as, as you have today and hanging out on Twitter, I bumped into Austin already and, you know, Lambda school, what they were doing and. Back home, I had seen a bunch of friends who could not break into top colleges, could not get into IITs, BITs, NITs, uh, back mm. uh, and uh, that the, the career sort of suffered because of not having that college signal. So I was like, Hey, there are all these smart people in like, you know, these IT service companies. Why don't we train them to join startups as a web, you know, developer, right? Why don't we teach them that? And finance it using an income share agreement, because that was what I had picked up from basically Lambda school. Austin Allred, yeah. Austin Allred, like, let's apply that model for India. And I think at that point of time, almost no one was, was doing that. There was only one player, uh, alt, alt campus. They were based out of Dharamshala. It was a physical boot camp. So we were like, why don't we do this online and open it up to everyone? Finally, our college students can you know take part. I think for the first time in my life, I did something that had a market, right? So we saw some validation, some traction, there were leads coming in. Of course, there was no upfront payment. So it was Diwali, right? Everyone, there was that demand, right? And we was, we were like super happy that finally something is, something has taken off. Ran that for about a year and a year, year and a half. A lot of people told us, why don't you move to Bangalore? You know, that's where the heart of the action is. But we were like, nay, nay, we, we want IV personal preference. We want to be based out of Goa and build this business in, in Goa. Don't see why we need to be in Bangalore when we've placed people, you know, just over a zoom call. Hmm. But then since we were just two, three random folks out of Goa doing, doing stuff, it was very hard to raise funds. We had a, you know, angel on board who had you know, put in, put in some of his own money, but yeah, couldn't really, you know, like we, we saw a lot of competition come raise money, hire teams took us over with market, like, you know, just pure marketing firepower, couldn't match that, couldn't raise another round. Uh, and then came COVID and we had to essentially shut shop because, mm. you know, the cash flow issues are real when it comes to an income sharing agreement based business, you deliver services upfront, we're paying salaries upfront, but mm. money comes in much later. And we were still sticking to the pure play ISA model, not like a debt model wherein, you know, which, which is now dominant in the market, wherein you're not really paying as per your income, monthly income, but you're just like signing into a two lakh 50,000, whatever uh, agreement, like debt agreement, right? Mm. We did not do that. So we couldn't really involve financing players, all of that to ease our cash flow issues. So sort of burnt our fingers there. And when we had to close, you know, shut shop, uh, that is when I met Aditya online again uh, on Twitter. And, uh, he was, he had raised like small round, I think an angel round to, you know, I think 120 K from better capital and so on. He was like, why don't, you know, you join our team. Why don't you bring in your team and join in? Because we had some experience running online boot camps. We knew how discord worked, how people sort of played online, uh, behaved online and so on. So we did that and for about six months. Tried out a bunch of experiments in what we called back then as learning communities. Uh, we helped creators, we pitched to creators saying, Hey, we will set up your online community, a learning community, subscription based revenue for you. It's going to be fun. All right. Then they realized there's no reason for subscriptions to exist in this learning space that people wouldn't really pay for subscriptions. People would pay for courses. Mm. Right. So we did, we pitched that, tried running that for a few creators who had a decent audience, by the way, 
we tried running facebook ads and so on we realized that it did not sort of in few cases we had like a grand total of zero right like paying customers which then sort of made it evident to us that to to start a course you need an audience of your own hmm. right you need to have built trust in a particular domain for you to be able to for people to trust you and pay up all right mm. otherwise you're just going to be falling into the typical cat problem that you just can't recover the money you put into ads because there's mm. no other acquisition channel built out so we dropped that idea right like interestingly if you look at it you know one year later the same model one year later you have maven which is gagan biani's uh, company they coined the term cohort based courses cbcs the exact business model just because they had a different access they could mm. access the top creators in the us they could successfully pull this off whereas thankfully we bailed out of that model it would have been a disaster for us if we could, hadn't pivoted away right. but the very the interesting bit is that while running this experiment we sort of realized that there is this white space wherein we could be helping business owners right why business owners uh, why working professionals uh, because we realized that no one would really pay a high ticket price for hobby classes or you know mm. just casual let's say cbc on history or philosophy i may watch a youtube channel but that doesn't mean i'm going to put down like you know a lakh to learn cooking mm. right mm. for example so we said let us focus on areas domains wherein you can tangibly show people an roi help people increase their income help people increase their earnings right and within that like just business owners we realize that there is no program good program for let's say smb businesses let's say, yoga uh, you know teachers there so many teachers who are good at yoga but can't do business very well mm. so teach them how to run business uh, teach you know shopify store owners how to run their shops better right so that is a space that we were exploring when we sort of realized that we, we realized two key things hey instead of relying on other people's audience and giving them a cut and you know just having so many more things that can go wrong why don't we build our own brand that was the first shift in thought that we had ki i have an audience on twitter uh, which was i think about i, I think i had around 5000 4000 followers or so. so i had my own audience so why not use my own audience and b forget business owners look at the biggest market for business education in india itself which is mba right like there's already an existing behavior among people you have engineers largely who may you know your typical male engineer who has graduated and did up in tcs infosys realize that hey i don't really want to do coding i want to apply to an iim give cat right mm-hmm. why don't we go after that persona and uh, help them sort of break into startups right because startups don't require you to have an mba degree startups is where people value competence more than credentials so why don't we set up that bridge for people who want to get into business roles help them to break into startups and that is how you know stoa school was was born pre launch we did a few we had learned our lessons so did a lot of user research figured out what people really want what are their fears aspirations debt was a big issue right so highlighted all of that in our messaging decided to sell before we build Mm. so we put up the landing page uh, you know did a few mock classes here and there got an idea of what few screenshots in fact that we could later on use saying that hey we teach business education launched it first built that hype out and then got to being ki are chalo like what is now the curriculum right mm. let us now figure out what exactly we want to be doing for 12 months who do who who we can get on to teach and so on so and i think this time around it worked very well so all of that you know hard work failing successively for 2 3 years sort of paid off when we got this launch and the 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 positioning so to say right yeah that's awesome so if i look at it you've just experimented all through over the last uh, you know 5 or 6 years and you failed forward right and you've right now arrived at a point where you have converged on something that works for the market is approximately the right time for such a thing and also you have the right mix of people as well running this right so more than a few things that i want to delve upon but i want to talk about this whole sell before you build and you know as a, fun- a function of that i mean building an audience right and uh, you know you you are popular on twitter i think you have probably about close to 10000 followers there for people who are listening 
how do they go about this right i mean how do you start building an audience for a product that you may not have already so i think uh, folks generally have an idea of what your interest inclinations are right so i see the problem with most people is that people want to build an audience right as an end in itself which i think mm. is not really uh, a smart thing for an entrepreneur to do you may be a content creator and that that may work out well like purely as a content creator right but if you are an entrepreneur and you want to convert that audience into a big fat top line you mm. want to know okay what is my end outcome do i want to launch a newsletter or you know do i want to launch a business in this tg and and pick pick a niche pick a niche pick four or five content pillars right these are the five things i'm going to be talk about regularly right Cy- topics that i'm going to be cycling through and you have to stay consistent for me it was uh, an 18 month long game being around on twitter to finally like being recognized right i think like if someone now picks throws my handle uh, around you would i think five on 10 people who work on the business side of the ecosystem would know who you are referring to so to get to that it took me almost 18 to 24 months it doesn't happen you know overnight i think mm. people people give up too soon when trying to build an audience and being around other creators right who are also trying to build their audience is is super helpful because in the end it's not a zero sum game everyone's building in their own niche and you can collectively grow by you know like endorsing each other and you know hanging out on each other's timeline so i think these are essentially what these are few of the key things that helped me build an audience i was consistent tweeting almost every day straight for 24 months you know and having a consistent theme which is i want to see people like me folks from tier 2 tier 3 india becoming wealthier getting to do things which were earlier only available to let's say folks outside of india in the western countries or in bombay delhi bangalore chennai kolkata other metros right so i think that has been my theme talked about education and bait stayed consistent lived up to it delivered results i think that is what everyone should aspire to do right right i think it's an interesting point that you bring up right which is to build an audience around affinity and interests mm-hmm. rather than simply mindlessly sort of focus on uh, uh, numbers sheer numbers mm-hmm. itself right because i think if you look at it as a means to an end then you know you are sort of building your prospective target audience in that sense right for a product or or a service that you may offer in the future so that's that's pretty interesting so let's uh, you know come to conventional b school education itself right i mean you're trying to solve this and you have very specific pg that you are uh, trying to solve this for right but before we approach that why is conventional b school education broken and uh, you know how can you fix it i think to start off it's damn expensive right uh, across the board right it is uh, pretty much expensive especially from if you look at it from an roi angle now okay isb i am top im fees are are high right i am abc fees are high no doubt but people end up getting good enough roi right of it so you can sort of fend that but if you look at like the majority of 3 lakh students who go into mba each year most of them like barely get any any roi on the time and monetary investment that day that day undergo right that that i think is a big big problem and why is that so is because people learn a lot of theory right most of them is outdated it's taught by people who are not really practitioners but career academicians all right who are out of touch of what is going on for example if i'm teaching someone marketing today i don't think you can survive without talking about reels and how how you can nail strategy right when it comes to reels which i'm sure that b schools up reels will come and go as a channel of acquisition by the time b schools even decide to update their curriculum so it's not relevant it's yeah. not practical right in the sense that today any operator would need to have some understanding of no code tools uh, of airtable of zapier things like that which i think are not even touched upon when it comes to traditional education and in the end i think startups is where most of most of the opportunities are today you can clearly see that there is like a lot of money pouring into the ecosystem fight for talent is real right salary prices i mean salaries are going higher just because of the constraints on the supply of, mm. of talent and most people aren't aware of this right most people aren't aware of the cycles on in which startups hire startups cannot 
plan their hiring months in advance the way a traditional b school would sort of place people right so a lot of these things uh, you know the, the the cycles on which they run on the the, the roi right like all of this is broken and as as i think as aditya my co-founder says the business of business education itself is pretty damn broken right at this yeah. point no i think uh, you're absolutely right you know there are probably about 5000 plus mba schools in the country right and i think the whole mba wave started with outsourcing basically 90s mm-hmm. you had a bunch of people who had to sell it and software and all of those things right and you needed people who could articulate well and who could understand sales and marketing and product and all of those things but i would argue that we've longed sort of we've outlasted all of that right i mean we've outlived all of that and today i mean uh, is it important for someone to know organizational design yes of course right i mean it might become important but it's it's probably more important for them to understand product management at a mm-hmm. 101 level right i mean if you're talking about a startup operator right so and uh, if i am hiring for my startup so would you know which of these skills would would matter more to me right and i think that's where something like stroa comes in as well right where you're trying to sort of like get it to one level below right mm-hmm. and and talk about the skills that someone could uh, start applying on a monday morning in uh, in their in their startup maybe even not at a startup right i mean they could start building their own stuff right mm-hmm. so what are some of the other skills that you think are necessary for like a 21st century b school grad i think as i pointed out things like no code right understanding digital very well because that's where most businesses are happening you cannot today call yourself a full stack marketer without a good understanding of paid channels that that have developed like let's say facebook ads google ads right the way brands go viral right the way brands now do pr mm. has also changed and this is just from point of view of marketing yeah. right like and it, when it comes to products right like there are more digital products that are that are being built and sold so people need to understand how the org org structure of let's say a product company sort of in 2021 is people need to understand how to deal with remote teams right something that i think is not at all taught and and i think a year ago none of us were prepared right we were used to micromanaging and so on whereas mm. that cannot really hold up in a remote first organization right so yeah just tooling being in touch with all the the latest business models right like saas the, the the metrics that you track in a saas business model are so damn different from you know your traditional metrics of let's say a manufacturing uh, business right the way you look at cash flows and financing is also completely different right so just understanding what is cutting edge can help people build that personal edge and get into better positions get into positions wherein you can be more prosperous right while helping the economy grow because if that talent is not in place not only does the talent pool itself suffer but also the companies yeah. right and then the greater economy so i feel this is like super critical for any well oiled economy that people can do the jobs that cutting edge companies require to be done now you're also operating in a very fragmented market right i mean education is Uh, like you know it has different sorts of players on the supply side and you know one of the uh, one of the challenges in this kind of a market is like you might start building something that you might start being everything for everybody right and that's a very grave mistake to do right i mean how are you consciously picking your user persona and the, the actual tg that uh, you know you're going to build for and sell to right i mean can you talk about the different cohorts that you have i mean uh, i think one of them you mentioned was let's say the engineer who spent about 2 years in tcs and right now considering you know moving to one of the hot startups for example are there any other types i mean the shopify owners are uh, are another type that you mentioned but could you just talk through these cohorts and you know what are you doing on a everyday basis in order to, for yourself to be like more relevant to them mm-hmm. i think this is a very interesting point uh, especially because i think we've had a very interesting time when it comes to you know just dealing with different persona now see, see the thing with business school in general is that a lot of people beat around the need for diversity right and i think diversity is good definitely diversity in interests right in in terms of backgrounds i think is definitely helpful but if you want to scale a business diversity in terms of outcomes and diversity in terms of personas that you take in right from an outcome point of view if it's too spread out it can pretty much kill you because then you don't really know what to measure for you don't know what mm. to build for that's something that you know we sort of fell prey to in i think when covid was in full force 
right? A lot of people are sitting at home uh, inside, people are already inside the startup ecosystem and they wanted stuff to do, right? Mm. And pretty much jumped into our program because it seemed like a nice deal, right? But, and we were also, I think, like pretty much up for having these people on because although we had launched, it was mm. still like a phase for us to understand who can we give what to most effectively. Right. Mm. But as time has passed by and now that COVID is sort of, you know, like wearing out for now, I think I'm getting a good sense, like literally the team is getting a good sense that we will have to double down on the persona, which is looking at breaking into startups. We would want to be dealing in helping more outsiders break in rather than getting into the market of people who are already, you know, into early stage startups and want to just upskill, you know, for the kicks. That hmm. it's it's fair to want to hang around in a community. It's fair to just learn business frameworks and models for one's own understanding, right? Hmm. But I think we would increasingly want to focus on helping people get jobs at startups in the you know eight to twelve sort of LPA uh, band, breaking into business roles at 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 startups. So yeah, I think there are a lot of personas, a lot of you know entrepreneur folks folks who are pretty senior looking at this as a refresher program mm. right uh, as a way of just catching in on trends but i think like we would want to we won't say no to these people but we won't target you know build an engine catering to these people we, we are better off helping people increase their income at the end of six months right of the program right so with this cohort in mind how do you go about designing the curriculum mm-hmm. I think designing the curriculum is pretty much like just asking ourselves who are the sort of people we would want to hire, right? Mm -hmm. If we can't hire people we're producing, are we even like doing a good job? Right. So I think that is the the first benchmark that we used to design the curriculum. And then it is just going about talking to companies on things that they feel folks who are incoming lack at. Uh, Generally, I think people do not have a good sense of, you know, how to communicate, how to deal with numbers. Right. Like I, a lot of founders I talk to say that you know, people don't have any understanding of how to, let's say, model numbers in, in Excel. There are situations wherein like most people who are not in the startup ecosystem, uh, have very little idea of what is Notion, what is Airtable, right? What these fancy tools that us highly productive startup janta uses. Mm. So getting people used to that, getting people fluent in the language of startups. So when someone talks about GTM, you shouldn't like get scared, right? When people, someone talks about a, asks you questions on GMV or CAC or LTV, you shouldn't, you should know what, what is being asked of you. You should know how to calculate these numbers and you know, get back. So we look at what are the gaps that are current, that, that recruiters are currently facing in the ecosystem and then sort of like work backwards building the curriculum. And I think, so when we went from the second cohort to the third cohort, we pretty much had like a 50% flip in the curriculum. So we threw away concepts, which we thought were more theoretical than needed, uh, threw away as in we put them into async content and cleared up more space in the program for more practical sort of skills, right? Like more of doing than receiving gyan, right? That's Mm. what the focus is on, is been on. And I think this is an iterative process. As we go on, I think we would be focusing more on proof of work, just getting people to prepare a portfolio of, you know, case studies that they have sort of cracked or, you know, like, let's say if if I'm into marketing, I should be able to create a brand at whim, at at a whim, right? I should be able to design, come with good copy. I should be able to understand what the positioning is, you know, perception mapping. I should be able to do that and demonstrate to any company I'm interviewing at that I'm capable of taking something from zero to one without external assistance. So we, we will be building all of these things into the curriculum as we go ahead. Nice. So, you know, you touched upon this as well, which is learning through osmosis, learning Mm -hmm. through practical stuff, right? And uh, I wonder if you can talk through the nuances of enabling that kind of a cohort based learning experience. So I think communities are beautiful, right? Like because mm. we build relationships, a lot of learning happens through mimesis, right? So if you go back to your classroom in, in college, you'd have your typical 
personas in class we are the front benchers who are answering all questions who are asking the right questions as well that sort of orient the rest of the class on what a good question is you have your back benchers right who are just like keeping the class fun who bring that energy to the class at times you have your class jesters who are just making fun you know just keeping it human and not boring right so all of these in fact like map very well to a session that runs on zoom you have your front benchers you have your back benchers in the chat all right front benchers on video who are constantly doing a back and forth with the instructor the class jokers making memes right so all of these when all of these elements are you know like faithfully reproduced online and i'm sure it, i'm i'm sure that one can do this because we, we have sort of good stuff you get a very high fidelity sort of equivalent of an offline setting happening online minus having to go to a common campus and migrating somewhere for 6 months or uh, right. two two years or whatever of course it doesn't beat the offline you know in person vibe but through proper design through designing interactions wherein people can come share their learnings ask for help give help and see that translate into social capital all of these things including your memes right i think are an integral part of what makes a, a community something people want to come back to right and that's i think the glue because education is inherently a very painful process when it's a, like when you, a good education is not it's not easy it's grueling right and you want a glue to sort of get you through that grueling experience and that is what is i think the function of you know a very strong vibrant supportive community in this entire process and i think it's again a very iterative thing community in our first squad which was 30 people strong was one thing but mm-hmm. now when we have 200 people going through the program at the same time across two different cohorts that's a complete different like you know game in itself and i i think that with every zero you add you will have a complete different dynamic sort of showing up so i'm i'm excited to see what the next sort of adding a zero to to what we already have what it does to how the community looks like and i think it's something that people are figuring out across the world Uh, yeah. community education community builders are still figuring out how does one deal with so many people how does one model this, these interactions in one's head right yeah again that's one of those challenges right because i mean part of the reason why people go to b school is also to form relationships with people who might you know become super important 5 10 years 15 years down the line right and uh, you have this rich alumni base and you could pick up the phone and talk to the head of a certain function or a certain company somewhere right so replicating that in a pure online community is is going to be a challenge for sure right i mean I, especially as you mentioned as you scale i've heard you speak earlier about working on the vibe right mm-hmm. now i instinctively sort of get what you mean but you know can you articulate you know what that means working on a particular vibe how do you figure that and how does all of that translate into the choices that you make every day quite a few factors go contribute to the vibe of a place right it's, it's the sort of energy which comes from the aspiration that aspirations that people sort of hold for me it comes from a lot of traits that people are forced to display not forced but like encouraged to display in our case we want people to be helpful to each other right because only when you help only when you have that you know you have ious floating around mm-hmm. in the community will people come back and sort of you know lay one thing on the other on top of it and build a relationship right so we already have people inside the community who have hired they've started companies together planning on starting companies together vendor contacts one of the most important things right like being able to just drop a message and say hey what's the best pr agency in your opinion and you'll have five people willing to make intros to you right so that is i think the the helpfulness i think is one of the most critical elements of 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 the vibe right just not like the ability to play positive some games because in college what happens is that limited set of companies coming in for placements placements happen over five times let's say five days right in b schools everyone is fighting for those few mm. positions when in that's not the case with us it's like more of an open market we have companies continuously coming in and people know that you know like other people around are not a threat to me right like i'm sure my friend can get a job i can get a job you all can get a job so let's just share things and help help each other out it's with the the sort of memes right uh, mm-hmm. also the, the vibe i would say goes all, also with the memes 
that people that become like a shared language inside the the community it is about the music that that people even listen to right so every session of ours starts with someone putting up the playlist and you know pumping music so there is that taste that is being sort of created people are discovering new songs new cafes new beers new you know whiskies and gins inside the the community so it's much more than just hey i am here to just get you know a, a better job or something and then buzz off it's mm. it's much more human than that and i think that's what is hard. i think would be hard for traditional players to replicate online it's not it's not easy and i think we pride ourselves about right. making that happen something you've also spoken about is being a content first company right where you want to put out as much useful content as possible out there for free and then have people only like you know pay you for you know the the practical stuff that you were talking about the cohort experience you were talking about and you know maybe learning certifications and so on and so forth right so could you talk a little bit more about that mm-hmm. i think when we started off we had this idea ki you know we need to impact as many people as possible because an economy can't like you you can't just impact a small section of society and expect the entire economy to grow and only when the entire economy grows it's like gets on that you know breakout sort of trajectory wherein you you have more goods and services being produced and consumed right we knew that through a services model we could only serve limited number of people let's be honest mm-hmm. with that right so content for us it serves two purposes one is just giving out a lot of you know value to people through live events through recorded content soon we're starting of uh, a blog we're doubling down on our youtube right mm. because we want to genuinely help as many people as we can and get as many uh, you know get as much as goodwill and well wishers out there on the street whether or not they apply for the program get accepted can afford it can't being you know, Im- immaterial to us so we want to genuinely give value and to a set of people in there who want the outcomes right that we sort of can deliver that is when you know they come in and avail of our, our prog- programs and i think this also helps us differentiate being content first not just for you know just doing seo for the sake of it and mm. getting some pair of hands to type out articles stuffed with keywords right like or you know like descending into that territory where you need sales teams to to sort of you know just annoy people to buy like just shove education down people's throat we we know we don't want to get into that territory because that's that's a pretty dangerous place to be in the content is also a critical part of our differentiation that is the reason why the founders put ourselves you know out there in the open which is something very few i think even education companies right now are willing to do it's largely you know third party all right whereas we want to own the voice of our brand what we stand for be the ones who tell our story to people rather than have it done through other folks so hence content i think it just helps us create value for others and for us yeah and speaking of stories you know what are some of your favorite stories and anecdotes of you know store alums over the last um, year maybe more than that so i think i remember you know this, this chap ankit ankit ruparel used to sort of chat on twitter even you know, for a year before store was sort of launched and you always wanted to doing a cfa back in the day always wanted to break into the scene right but unfortunately he was from a non branded sort of so to say engineering college was stuck in it role at lnd infotech and by the end of it right he pretty much like by the end of the store program like he he sort of one of the first people to buy in right to the program because he had built that relationship over twitter by the end of it he sort of broke into like a founders office role at went wealth right mm. and almost i think tripled his like take home through through that process he's now in the finance sector in a business role went from actually just being on the outside reading pr on your story to now directing like communications at pr at wind wealth right in a span of under i would say 4 months so that is like a story that i that that keeps us you know nice coming back to work every day there there have been many more cases of people working at you know marketing agencies or like somewhere in infosys not having hope in themselves ki you know i can do better i think people hold there's a dearth of confidence right ki i can also be someone do something but just seeing how people's attitude has changed going from 
do i really deserve anything more someone if someone came and told these folks that you know what you are worth 3x more they'd laugh laugh back at the person saying that like making a joke at me right now people have developed that confidence wherein they are doing outbound writing cold mails uh, and you know asking for what they deserve multiple places where this has sort of played out and i think that really makes me happy that makes the team sort of happy and keeps us going these stories of hustlers from non metro backgrounds who've been through some crazy adversity uh, stepping it up and you know giving it back to sort of life yeah that's awesome that's awesome you're sort of fueling aspirations you're making dreams come true in some sense right so you know when we speak of the edtech ecosystem right I mean, and there are sort of mixed uh, feelings on on that front right i mean it's amazing that you know i think edtech will probably reach the last mile in india right i think uh, from kashmir to kanyakumari i mean the way to cover and the way to deliver education will will be online right and it will be the best of the best of the best right but it's also as you mentioned earlier i mean it's it's also being shoved down people's throats through very aggressive sales and what not right and and you're part of this edtech ecosystem so how do you see yourself as a part of this i mean what are you optimistic for you know going forward i think it's just the proliferation of content i would say i think with smaller creators coming into the fray right smaller creators don't have as much you know power to sell right set up a sales team but they have the power to build trust so they have the power to pull people towards them mm. right i believe that that sort of a model even when what model that an academy was built off right they have creators uh, rather than like a massive sales team so it's more of a marketing driven model than a sales driven uh, model i think that has that gives me some hope for where mm. the industry is going when most of these traditional players started off there was a case around degrees right that i think uh, is also like i mean most edtechs in higher ed space are just degree printing machines they just 10x the ability of yeah. institutions to print degrees so that that was their leading edge mm. once they burn out of the market once they sort of you know like get done with the market once people get degree get get a degree and the number of government jobs by the way is like on the decline right so the acceptance for degrees is also sort of is is going to be not acceptance but the relevance the need for doing degrees is also going to go down as a as a trailing factor of that trend and more private companies of course they don't want to pay a bomb to mm. to hire people and when you have people coming in with a lot of debt you have to pay a bomb the whole market adjusts itself to to that right as private companies proliferate degree trend is also going to ease off in the next decade and that will lead to more outcome based you know programs sort of popping up right this is something that will play out well in higher ed i'm not really sure about k12 wherein you know it's a different game because outcomes are not really to be seen for years you know in a line they still mm. metrics that are used are still measured in terms of marks rather than lpa right so maybe that scene is going to evolve at its own sort of trajectory and pace k12 one but definitely creators are still going to establish themselves there yeah one of the most exciting things right now is that teaching has scale right i mean you're not limited by the classroom you're not limited by a physical space i mean literally you could be an amazing teacher somewhere in raipur or coimbatore or wherever right and in you know teach an infinite number of uh, students right i mean uh, from wherever you are and so i think there'll be like a lot of wealth creation for teachers deservedly so right good teachers and uh, Uh, at the same time you know this whole shift from credentials to competence right i think is happening right i mean we're, we're seeing it at the higher ed uh, space and and it will soon sort of percolate down downstream is also what i feel so raj this has been a fascinating conversation i think we've spoken about plenty different aspects and nuances uh, on edtech and how you're building stoa school before we sign off what are some books and podcasts that you recommend well i think i used to listen to a lot of podcasts back in the day right nowadays i just don't seem to find time so recommending podcasts would, would definitely be, be be hard for me at this point but when it comes to books i think just the classics i think the classics always work very well right like be it uh, z- reading 0 to 1 once every year because every time you go back it's a different you know lesson in itself yeah. reading you know blogs by operators right like the good old high growth handbook or and it grows high output management i think these have sort of given me disproportionate value as compared to books 
which which are more you know fad fad driven right like even hard things about hard things i think that puts you in the right sort of yeah. uh, zone so either go lindy that is read classics or just feed off you know tweets and blogs and stuff which is more in tune with tactics more ephemeral right things that are relevant you need for your job today but may not be relevant 5 10 years uh, down the line so th- that's how i think i've been putting my content consumption so to say i i need to take more time off to read and to listen but that's i but i hope i get time you know enough to yeah, do that that's well. that's on everyone's wish list right i mean we all hope that we had more time to do all of those things so anyway so this was a fun conversation thank you so much again for being so gracious with your time and sharing all of these insights really really enjoyed this conversation and uh, look forward to talking to you again soon thanks man thanks thanks for having me over and i hope the listeners had a fun time too i think if if any questions if anyone wants to follow up always available on twitter write me up and we can take it out from there thank you so much for listening if you liked this episode then don't forget to subscribe to us on your favorite platform and share this episode with all of your fellow startup operators also follow the startup operator on linkedin and twitter for more updates stay safe take care and see you soon on a brand new episode of the startup operator